morning. <laughs> Good morning to you online. It's so great to have you with us. Happy 18 years. Can you believe this? 18 years. This church is older than my kids. This is crazy. I am so fired up, so stinking excited. Uh, I, 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 what God is doing is amazing. He is so good. And today we celebrate all that he's done, all that he's currently doing, and we rejoice that our best days are ahead. All, all that he is about to do, y'all, I'm so fired. There are so many surprises coming your way. I, I'm only going to scratch the surface today. It has all been leading up to this. Today we want to look at the gathering at the community, how to renew our friendships, how to renew our, our communities, our squads, if you will. So what we're going to do today, because fellowships and friendships are one of the most important decisions we can make, I thought it would be fun to put up on the screen a few squads, if you will, from days gone by. We've got some old school stuff, we've got some new school stuff, and I want you to see how many of them you recognize, okay? If you know where they come from or what movie, will you just shout it out and help me out? And a gold star if you can name the people in some of these photos. Okay, we're talking about fellowships and squads. I'm going to make it easy. The first one's easy because you can't talk about fellowship without these guys. What's this from? Lord of the Rings. Who knew that? All right. Okay. Can anybody name all the people on there? Anybody can do that? Really? Look at Okay. All right. Yeah, we got, I know Gandalf in the middle and Bobo's Fro Frodo, one, one of them. So, uh, Aragorn's one of them. Some of those. All right. Okay. How about this squad? You recognize this one? Goes with it. Who can name all of them? Anybody? Yeah? Colin, of course, Dave. All right, I know we got Egon's one of them. Egon, he's got the glasses. Next to him is, is it Winston? And then beside him, uh, Pete, Pete Bankman, right? And then Ray. What did you do, Ray? What just popped in? It was a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. He was harmless. Couldn't hurt him. All right, what else we got? Another, another squad. Oh, boy. Stranger Things. How many knew that? All right. I don't know what this is because I don't watch it, but I asked the teenagers, hey, when you think of squad, who do you think of, right? What's the name of the girl in the middle? Right. Her name is a number. This is weird. What is, what is happening here? All right. What's another squad we got here, David? Oh, yes. High School Musical. All right. Who can name them all? Who's the guy on the left? Chad. Troy, Gabriella, Sharpay, Ryan. All right. Look at that. Useless knowledge, fellas. Right there. Right there. What's another squad? What else? Oh. Princess Bride. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. You are easy to impress. All right. You may name him. Andre the Giant. His character's name? Fezzik. Colin's got it. And the guy in the middle, nobody knows. Okay, well, you know. All right, that's awesome. And then, of course, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Right? All right, we got another squad. How many? We oh, the Sandlot. How many know this? You're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> you got it. James has it. James has it. We won't name them. All right, what else you got? You got any more? Oh, going old school. Scooby-Doo. Anybody grow up watching this? All right. Fred, still watching it? <laughs> okay, all right. Pray for Roy. I always get the girls mixed up. One of them's Daphne, one of them's Velma. Okay, all right, got it, got it, thank you. Look at you, man, you guys are fired up about Scooby-Doo. I like it. Anyone else got another squad? Old school, Gilligan's Island. All right, we've got to name them all together. Who's on the left? Skipper, Gilligan, Ginger, Mr. Howe, Mrs. Howe. Oh, y'all are so impressive. All right. Now, that's old school, but what we're going to go with next is truly old school. The real squad, the chosen. I want you to know, thank you, Milo. You don't have to name them all, buddy. Appreciate that. The one I, the one I want you to focus on is John, the beloved, one of the closest that ever got to Jesus. John was familiar with what it meant to have a fellowship, a gathering, a squad, if you will, of core committed people dedicated to following Jesus and to walking that journey alongside. You with me? John was one of these great disciples who had an inside view, an inside track. And this is so important because if you show me your group of friends, it will often reveal the trajectory of your life. In other words, show me your friendships and I will show you the direction of your life. Nine times out of 10, this is a great predictor. 
Some of us today have done good. We've chosen wonderful friendships, friendships that constantly encourage us, that lift us up, that make us more like Christ. But maybe not all of us. Maybe we struggle with that. Maybe some of us have had bad choices with friends and they pull us down. Or maybe they, they don't have our best interests. Or maybe they're even selfish or abusive. I have good news. If that's you, if you identify with that latter group, John has some incredible wisdom today of how to break that cycle, some ways that we can actually walk this road with like-minded believers. He shows how important it is to be aware, to be mindful of who we walk with in life. So go ahead and open to 1 John chapter 2. If you're following along digitally, you got your, uh, your app. I'm going to read from the NKJV translation today if you want to sync up with me. The New King James is going to be in chapter 2 of 1 John, starting in verse 3 through verse 6. All right, let's follow along. It says this. Now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. I love that translation, but now I want to go to the message translation. Same verses. Check out the subtle hints at how to live this today. Okay, starting in verse 2, he says, Here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. Keep his commandments. Boom, right there. It's so simple. Verse 4, he says, If someone claims, oh, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he is obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived. Wow. Did you catch that? John is saying that when we follow God's commands and we truly walk in his ways, it blesses our life, Plus, it provides protection from all this unnecessary harm. It is a win-win. Who doesn't want that? So John is offering us a simple test. If you want to know where we find ourselves, the mark of a committed Christian is someone who keeps his commands. So you know i got to ask, how are you doing with that? Or better yet, how is your squad doing with that admonition from Scripture? How are they doing with keeping the commands? Because here's, here's your first truth that I want you to take with you today, all right? And man, oh man, do I wish somebody had shared this with me when I was in high school or even middle school. So younglings, listen up. Here is the warning. Choose your community. Choose your gatherings. Choose your friends wisely. This is so important. Choose the kind of person who holds the word of God in high regard. This will help you in your life. If you are surrounded with people who know this book, who speak truth to you, who are not ashamed to know Jesus and to encourage you, and also, dare I say it, they're willing to hold you accountable. Say, hey, man, I noticed this and this. Maybe you're getting off track. Hey, help me, I'll help you walk back on the path. These are the people, people who believe that it's more important to serve Christ than serve ourselves. You want to surround yourselves with people who believe that it's important to gather to love, to serve, to encourage each other, to pray for each other. Because when you go through the difficult times, whoo, and they're coming, if you haven't had them yet, your true friends will be revealed. When you go through tough times, man, this past year has been tough and painful for many, myself included. When the tough times come, you will be amazed by the response of your squad. Sometimes you'll be amazed for good. Sometimes you'll be amazed for bad. You'll be shocked. You'll be surprised. Those who support you, those who stay with you, and those who walk away. So choose your friendships carefully. John is saying those who support you during those tough and tragic times reveal you have chosen wisely. And as you get older, those friendships that stay with you will become sweeter and sweeter, and you will cherish them. Trust me, younglings, it's hard to appreciate this. I once heard someone say, when you're young, you don't fully realize and grasp how special your friendships are, how special that squad is, because you're young and you're full of life and you've got good health. So younglings, enjoy it. Because I'm learning, when you turn about 45, 50, that check engine light's going to come on and your health is going to start barking at you. 
and you're going to have to go and, and meet some doctors. And, and that was a story with this guy I read just this week named Brad Hathaway. And he lived in Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. He was in his mid-50s, and he had been putting off seeing his doctor, and he finally went. Oh, <laughs> this hits too close to home. And the doctor said, we, we got to have a little reckoning. Because I'm not liking your diabetes rising. I'm not liking your weight. I'm not liking, I mean, are you doing anything to be healthy? Well, no, because it's time. You need to start exercising. You need to start lifting weights. You need to start eating better. You, you got to walk, if nothing else. But this time, Brad Hathaway decided, okay, I'm in. I'll do it. And he made it his goal from that day forward, over the next weeks, months, and years, to walk around the circumference of the earth. Okay? Not, not like walk it literally, but the equivalent distance of 24,901 miles. He started at 55. He finished last month at age 88. This guy said that he would walk between 3 and 10 miles every day because he took it seriously. And he said when he first started, he was able to walk by himself. But as he got a little older and the, the weather got badder and the distance became a little bit tougher... He started to need a, a cane. And then eventually, the last several hundred miles, he had to finish it step by step with a walker. Check out his quote. He says, as time went on, walking got a little harder. Then my walking stick helped me for a few years, and now I have this walker to help me. Here it is. This walker was my steady companion. 88 years old. Don't miss that. It is nearly impossible to walk this hard life alone. And you weren't meant to. You weren't meant to. This is what it means to have a, a life of discipline, fellowshipping, and gathering with other like-minded believers to bring you up, walking in obedience and holiness and love, so that we're not just existing, just clinging so desperately to our life, that we're not doing anything to advance the kingdom. And then when Jesus shows up, he says, what did you do with the time, treasure, and talents I gave you? He says, nothing, but I'm still here. I protected my life at all costs. I didn't do anything to advance the kingdom. But Jesus, look. Can you imagine? He has a parable about that. And I think it is so critical for us to be in the truth, to be a lighthouse for the lost, to be open and saying no one will be turned away because this life is hard. It is tough. And people need to know your hope. We're not supposed to take our candle and our light and hide it under a bushel and say, I'm safe, I'm good, I'm saved, my family's saved, I'm going to heaven when I die. And knowing Jesus isn't about fire insurance. It's about sharing the gospel and taking as many with us as we can possibly take into eternal life. So John is saying, do a sober assessment of your current community and ask yourself, are we personally walking in the light? Are the people we surround ourselves keeping God's word faithfully? To do that well, you have to begin your friendship, your squad, with the core. And your core starts with your creator. So if you're new to the faith and you're kind of checking this out, or maybe you stumbled upon us online, you don't even know how it happened, it wasn't an accident, God wants you to hear this. Befriend him first. That's where it all begins. We must befriend God first. Start with him. Without being committed to this vertical relationship, all the horizontal relationships will suffer. All of them will be strained. They'll be stressful. They won't be all that God had. If we do not have that horizontal connection with our creator, John gives us another test. He goes back a chapter. Flip back to John uh, chapter 1 in 1 John, starting in verse 5. He says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. Check out the same verse in the message. He says this. This, in essence, is the message we heard from Christ. And now we're passing it on to you. God is light. Pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in him. If we claim that we experience a shared life with him and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We are not living what we claim. Mm-mm-mm. John tells us the message that's been passed to him. Remember, he was an eyewitness of this. This is not some second, third, or fourth-hand account. He saw this. The message is simple. God is the source of all light. God is the source of all goodness. You see darkness in this world? You're the light because you know the Father. You're supposed to share that. We're not supposed to hide it. 
We're not supposed to, to keep it hidden. God is a source of glorious light. His brilliant, radiant light, when it shows up, there is no darkness in God. It's supposed to expose it, okay? So know that when John says we must be careful to walk in the light, he is being very serious with you, followers of Christ. Church, hear me. We are called to walk in the light, and we can't claim to have community, to have a fellowship with him if we live in darkness, if we allow sin to remain. That makes us liars, and the truth is not in us. See, a friendship with God will expose the dark corners of our lives. And so here's the warning, okay? You know me, I'm going to be honest with you. Don't be afraid when you step into God's light and allow him to shine his light on your heart. Don't be afraid if it reveals darkness in your heart and sin. That's normal. That's what God does because he is holy and he's awesome and he's worthy to be praised. He is matchless, radiant light. And when it shows on our darkness, man, it's, it is awful when you see it. But he invites you to confess that, to become clean, to become white as snow. Think about this. Y'all remember when you were maybe in college in those nasty freshman dorm rooms and your roommates were lazy and they would never do their dishes and they would always leave them stacked up there and the food would be there for like a week or two or five. And you'd get up at 3 a.m. to get a drink of water and you'd turn on the light and all those gross bugs would scatter like roaches and stuff. That is nasty. That is gross. I remember laying in bed. I was being a bad guy because I was eating in bed. Apparently I'd done this a few times. And it was just the TV, and I was watching the show. I was by myself, and I was watching this, this show. Can't, don't remember what it was. It was the only light on in the room, but it was just enough light that I saw beside me on the wall the largest cockroach I have ever seen. I, it was mad, like I'm blind as a bat, and I saw it out of the corner of my eye. When I looked, it was so big, y'all, we could put a saddle on it. Mercy could ride it. it was, you could give it a name and make it a pet. And I was like, what do I do about that. How do I kill that? Can you even kill something like that? And I remember being kind of freaked out until something raced across my shoulder, across my chest, and down my stomach. Yeah, that was my reaction too. It had my attention. Now what do I do? Do I kill it? Do I? What? My hand went up. I'm like, I have got to end this life. I have to, right? And so without really thinking about it, I went whack. Okay? On my stomach. And I'm like, well, now what? Do I look? Because <laughs> I got to know what it was because it was crunchy. Right? You know what I'm talking about? It was like, shoom. I mean, it was so hard and big. It probably had a skeleton. And I look. And my horror drifted away. And I was relieved because it, it, was, it ended up being a, a giant brown peanut M&M that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> so I was eating M&Ms earlier and I'd lost one. Yeah? And now I had a treat. So I ate it. Here's my point. <laughs> if I had turned on the light, I would have seen that. And when we turn on the light and allow God to show up in our heart, it reveals things like that. It reveals the dirty roaches. Sometimes it reveals the peanut M&Ms. And there's the good things. And you celebrate. Because God's not some evil genie in the sky with his flies water saying, whack, stop it, knock it off. He is desirous of a friendship with you. He's not some ogre in the sky. Now check out, John asked this, look at John 1, 7. He says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all that sin. All the darkness is gone. There it is, a healthy community, a strong group of friends. It begins with a deep connection to God and his local church. And that connection then allows us to surround ourselves with people who bring us up not people who bring us down. And it lights that fire. So hear me. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. Hear me. If you feel like your faith has waned over this last year, could it be that you have disassociated and you have taken your coal out of the fires of God and set it on the hearth and it's grown gray? But the good news is when you take that same coal and you put it back into the fire with other coals, it roars back to life. It is not over. It is not a waste. When we walk in the light, we have fellowship with the light, fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin. That is the goal. That is what we want. The admonition that John is saying is walk with others in the light. So how are you doing with that? Mom, dad, grandparents, younglings, teenagers. Let me, let me talk to the teenagers here today. Here's a test I want you to do. If you look at your closest friendships, 
would you say they make you more like Jesus? It's a great test. Adults, you could do this too. When you look at your circle of friends, your squad, would you say they make you more like Jesus, having been with him, or less? What a powerful, powerful question to ask. When we walk in the light of God, our path is bright, and we have nothing to fear. And I am so grateful that God is doing so many amazing things in our students and our youth ministry. Y'all, God is on the move. It is growing so rapidly and strong. Jason and his amazing team of teachers have been pouring their lives into our teens, and buddy, does it show. It is so, in fact, just a few short weeks, they're going to have a chance to do something they've never done. They're going to go to a retreat that is just for them, and it is a three-day retreat. Y'all, I'm so excited about this because when you go to camp, I was saved at a retreat just like this, where I got away from the friends who were bringing me down, and I surrounded myself with friends who wanted to walk in the light, and it changed my whole life. It set me up to surrender to the ministry the next year, this kind of retreat. So parents, encourage your teens to go to this. And if you have any issues with money, please, that is not a concern at all. We will handle that. The deposit's coming up. God is doing such a powerful work in our students. Our midweek youth Bible study is so packed and overflowing, they've had to vacate this campus and move into the East Campus just so they could spread out and have enough room. Think about, who does that? During a pandemic, there are churches shutting their doors and never opening again. Nobody came. They didn't have anybody. There was no support. It just, the fire went out. And these kids are making the choice. They could be anywhere. Think about that, y'all. They have driver's license. <laughs> they have freedom. And they choose to come and be here. That's awesome. That is incredible. See, 1 Timothy 4.12 says this. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I am so, so thankful that God is raising up a faithful generation to come after us. If Jesus holds off his return, a generation who strives to live this, aren't you? Man, God bless them. Teens, hear me. This church believes in you. We believe in you. In fact, we believe in you and your future so much that I'm excited to announce a surprise today, something we've never been able to do, but we have wanted to really since the beginning. Because of the faithfulness of two church members, we are going to be able to award a Potter's Hand scholarship to a graduating youth. That is a big, yeah, you can applaud that if you want. That is a big deal. But wait, there's more. This right here, this, what makes this so awesome to me is this scholarship is not based on academics. It's not based on athletic prowess. It's not based on your sporting skills or your voice or your instrumental degrees or any of that. It's not even based on need. This right here will be called the Timothy Scholarship. The reason why is because this scholarship will be based simply on their faithfulness to live this verse out. To walk in purity and love and light. Oh, and did I mention that it won't be given to just one faithful church member who's graduating? It will be given to every current active faithful student about to graduate. Every single one. If you have remained faithful and you've done what God has asked you to do in this, come May, you're going to have a nice surprise. Because somebody was faithful and stepped forward and said, how do we pour into the lives of our next generation? How do we bless them? Y'all, this is such a big deal. And this is, this is just one of several things coming down the pike. You're going to be hearing more about that in the coming days. So wait till I talk about the children in the preschool. See, God is on the move among them too. And you're going to have a chance to bless them in just a minute. So wherever God has you, at your office, at your work, at your school, maybe he is calling you to be the catalyst for revival. Maybe he is calling you to be the change that sparks a revival, a renewal in your squad, in your area, your sphere of influence. Here's a true story of how this happened. There was a low-income community in Mexico, and it was awful. It was riddled with bullets. You could drive by and see holes in the wall. They were dirty. The old white buildings had been dilapidated. Violence was on the rise. Crime was everywhere. And the city was trying for years to curb the danger because families kept leaving. They said, we're out. We're done. And they kept moving. And the violence just only got worse in the neglected homes and the dirty streets. It wasn't until they got desperate enough that the city officials said, all right, you know what? We're going to turn it loose to a group of artists 
and a group of repairmen to come in, whatever it takes, to come and make things better. And they went in, in a short period of time, they began to fix broken windows and sweep things up and repaint. In fact, they decided to paint the entire city in a giant, multicolored rainbow. And the most amazing thing happened. Crime dropped. Violence dropped. Families began moving back in. In fact, it was so amazing, this is now heralded as the safe place to live. It is their safe haven. All because it began with someone doing a little paint and some simple renovations. Okay, remember that. Because today, we celebrate God's faithfulness. From the early days, when it was just a handful of us on that frozen morning. I was talking to Doug Bell this morning about it. Who's that handsome man with all the hair and the shiny red shirt back there? Can you believe that? Day one. Some of you were there for that. Cold, rainy. And then from there, we were able to move to, oh, oh boy, oh. The dark, stinky, smelly cafeterias with sticky floors with substances we still ain't identified. And look at those stools, how comfortable, hard plastic. No backs. You think these are bad. When you sat down and you left service, you were one inch shorter every week. Your compression was unbelievable. And we did that, setting up and tearing down and setting up and tearing down. And it was tough. And then God brought us to a place where we could have some permanence and serve him. And he has been so good for 18 years. Y'all, it is no accident. The gathering has been placed here for such a time as this. This is our time to be that lighthouse. The cost, the, the, it is too great for us to turn inward. We must turn outward. The world is dying and going to spend eternity without the Father unless we carry the light, unless we walk in the light. As John. I'm so, so, so excited about the future. God has lit a, even a hotter fire in me, and I've been praying about this. I know our best days are ahead. He has a bigger and more incredible vision. Some of you remember several years ago when we launched a, a five-year vision plan called Catch the Vision. Anybody remember that? Some of you have been so faithful to this. Over the last five years, you have been faithfully giving, and you responded with such graciousness and enthusiasm and generosity as you always do, and your commitment never wavered, even through bad times. Because of your faithfulness over these last five years, we have been able to do so, so much to grow, to expand, to accommodate our growth, to acquire new campuses, to start a school, to be able to repair things that have gone bad. So today I want to say thank you. Hear me. For you who have been faithful above and beyond your ties and you have been doing this for years, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so thrilled to be able to officially say the Vision Campaign has completed its five-year goal and it has been a huge success because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness on behalf of the staff and the servant leadership team of elders, thank you. God has blessed us so much, right? So how awesome is it that a pastor in this day and age can stand here today and say, if you have been faithfully giving to this, stop. <laughs> stop. Take a pause. We have reached a goal because of generosity, because of your faithfulness. I want you to take a breather. This was never meant to be a, a life sentence, like those toll roads that pop up and it's just for a couple years, then when it's paid off, and the next thing, it's like 27 years later, and your grandkids are still driving. Why, why are we paying for that, right? It's not supposed to be like a government toll road. We have reached a goal, and we, you, so you have more than fulfilled your commitment when you sign that card, all right? Now, let me say this. You may be saying, Pastor, that's awesome. Appreciate that, but no offense. I didn't make a commitment to you. I made a commitment to God. I understand. If you feel led to continue to give to that, I promise no one will stop you, <laughs> okay? You can continue to do that above and beyond your right touch. But I wanted you to hear God has been faithful. And on this anniversary, when we can celebrate the closing of one chapter and be excited about what comes next, hear me. The reason God has been faithful, I believe, I've been praying, God, why are you blessing this church so much? When I look around and I meet with other pastors and all I hear are the sob stories and terrible and church, 1,800 pastors a month are quitting. And I'm just, I'm just in shock. I'm like, what is going on? What is, what is happening that's not happening here? I'm like, thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful. And I said, God, why is it? And he said, you have stayed faithful as I have been faithful. God is a generous God, and you have been generous. You have blessed families. You have not held the money. You have passed it on, and we're going to continue that. We're not going to shut down. We remain open. We don't turn anyone away. If you feel it's safe to come, you come. And if you don't, we work hard to have a great online experience. If it's not safe for you, then for you, it's not. You make that choice. But as for me and my family, we are going to do our best to be a lighthouse to this world. 
because the world needs it. The community needs this. We are going full steam ahead. So if you hear the vision might be reaching its goal, please don't assume that we're taking the foot off the gas. Please don't assume you don't have to invest or engage anymore with your time, your treasure, and your talents, because we have exciting things coming down the pike. Here's what we're going to do in the very short term, okay? Woo! Over the next five weeks leading up to Easter, we are going to pray. And you're going to pray for your one, the one person that you want to see come to know Christ. You're going to pray for that one person to invite to Easter Sunday morning. Who is it? We're going to pray hard, and we're going to, some of us are going to fast for these people. These next five weeks leading up to Easter is full steam ahead. See, we just finished that four-week emphasis focused on me and ourselves, focused on renewing our spirit, focused on renewing our love, getting back to our first love. Today, focused on renewing our community and our fellowship with each other. Now, to get ready for Easter, we are going to talk about renewing the place where we gather. As we pray and invite our lost friends, our neighbors, to our big Easter celebration, we want to make sure we are ready to receive them and to receive them with excellence. Okay, a lot of things, if you look around closely, a lot of things are tired. <laughs> Some things are worn out. Don't point to your spouse. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about things, okay? Some things are very tired and worn out. Last week, we walked down the hall, and the smell of death was heavy in the air, and our 18-year-old refrigerator gave up the ghost, and you could smell the decay when you opened it up. How long had that been off? Because of generous donors, we have a brand new fridge put in yesterday, and it's cool, so your food is safe today when you want to come by and take it. If you ate something last week, I can't vouch for that. Okay? Some things need repairing. A lot of this stuff doesn't cost much. A lot of this stuff is things that, because of donors, because of your faithfulness, we can afford to do this. We're going to take care of some long over. Last year, we didn't get to have our service day. Remember, we shut down. Remember, it was just 15 days to, to flatten the curve. Remember that? That happened this time last year. So we had to cancel this. So here's what we're going to do. If you've been looking for a tangible way to serve God, to serve his local church, and to serve others, here is your date. Get out your calendar and write this down. Saturday, March 13th, 1030 to 3. You can drop in. You can stay as long as you want. You can, we're going to feed you. We're going to have food, fun, fellowship, and we'll sweat. We're going to have some fun as we come and do these things that need to be done. All right, so I mentioned our youth earlier. Now I want to share a little bit about our children in our preschool because they are on fire for the Lord too. And Nancy and Leanne are doing a phenomenal job ministering and pouring their lives into our younglings, our precious kids. Our preschool and our children area is going to be the focus of a lot of our service day projects. It's going to be obviously the painting of the hallways, the far hallways. We're going to do a whole new scheme. We've got brand new decals with scriptures and giant verses. They're going to be so encouraging because we have people up here every day now, every day, seeing and passing these halls. And we want to have truth in front of them. And then we're going to go and revamp that playground because the molts, all the rain has washed it away. So if you want to help us with that, we're going to restain the wooden structure. Maybe you've got some wrenches. We want to tighten the existing stuff. But you know we've had a lot of cold and nasty weather. We've had some rough, rough times coming. And probably the most exciting project we're going to do in the children's wing is we are going to convert an indoor play place. So it doesn't matter what the weather does. So our youngest, our twos and threes can come and they can safely play without older kids being all over them and without tripping or, or, or scaring them. So if you are good with tinkering or assembling, we need help putting something like this together, okay? I promise you do not want your kids playing on this if I put it together. We need somebody who's good at this, okay? This is just one of, of several things. And we're not just going to focus on just here, although I'm going to run through all these projects in a second. You can sign up on your way out. We want to look outward. We want to be a blessing to Norris Park, our immediate neighbors, because we've got lost people on every side of us. Last year, we weren't able to go and do our loving our neighbors. We usually do Christmas thing. We get to go and invite them to church, bring them goodies and all your home-baked goods. Nobody did that this year. We couldn't do that. So I drove around. I said, Lord, what can we do that's simple, that we can do. That doesn't cost a whole lot of money, but we can show them we're here. We love them. We're your neighbor. Hey, come on, check us out. How can we serve you? No strings attached, just because we love you. And I saw it. And I went to Jimmy King, who's the gracious landlord who owns all of these campuses, who, by the way, has reduced our rent and our lease all during this. He has been so faithful, so generous. And we're passing that on. I said, Mr. King, is there something we can do? And he said, no, 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 no. You guys don't. You just take care of yourself. I said, no, no, no. We want to do. And then I saw it. And then I saw it again, and then I saw it again, and I saw it again. Something so simple that I said, can we take care of replacing all of these old signs that are leaning and look like broken teeth everywhere, and some are missing? Y'all, he lit up. He said, you would do that? 
I'll write you a check. And I said, no, no, we've got this. This is a service project that I want to do. There's 10 of them. This is great. Maybe you're online and you consider yourself high risk. This is perfect. Maybe you want to come, you and a spouse or somebody. All you need is rich. We'll provide the signs. It's socially distanced. You can be outdoors. Maybe you want to chime in and, and do something like that. But there's 10 of them all around this campus that we want to go straighten them up and replace them with all new ones. Now, there's several other things that you have a chance to do. And so I'm going to let the camera pan this way. If y'all are sitting on the front row, you can turn around. Just simple things. After we have our closing prayer, you can come by. Some of them are in the worship center. If you look up, you'll count some stained tiles. Some of you have been doing it my whole sermon. I see you doing it. We've got the ladder. We'll have these. Just come. We need a couple people to do that. New blinds for the worship center. Some of these old ratty ones are under here. We're changing these to a different color, dark charcoal gray. And I almost ruined a surprise. There's a reason why we're doing that. You just need to take those to Lowe's, talk to Mr. Hayden, and we want to get these changed out. If you're willing to take those and handle it, assemble the lobby banner curtains. New curtains are coming that aren't see-through. We just need somebody to do that. We've got a giant welcome banner that needs to be assembled. It's lightweight. You can sit down and do it. Won't take long. We can knock down, assemble some tables. Some new tables are coming. We just need to have somebody willing to just screw those together. Maybe you want to handle the food and the snacks and the lunch for the volunteers that day. We need somebody to handle lunch to feed the, the hungry tribe. Outdoor grounds and buildings. Trim the hedges. This is simple, but every one of these entryways has slowly been growing up to where almost now you've kind of got to shimmy in some of these, all right? You don't have to get off the ground. You don't need a ladder. We're literally going to just expand those. If you have that kind of equipment and you'd be willing to do it, work outside, would you sign up? Just let us know, and then we'll get in contact with you. Power wash the indoor pH entry mats. Somebody last year took those and took them to the car wash, hung them up with that big shh thing. It took a little longer to dry than we thought, so you want to have a spot to hang them for a day or two. But if you would take those, there's one there and there's one in the children's lobby, that would be awesome. Uh, replace the handicap signs. We talked about that. There's 10 of those. Recess the flag spikes. We need somebody with a post hole digger. Maybe that's you to dig a hole in the ground and put that round PVC in the ground so our spikes can be left in there. They don't have to keep hammering them in in the cold and the ice and snow. They're under there, and the mowers can go right over it. Okay, it's underground. Simple thing, but it just needs somebody who has a heart to serve to do that. Clean the front entryways, east and west campus. There's some crazy, funky stuff, something growing on there. I don't even know what that is. We want to be ready to receive the guests. You got some cleaner? If not, we'll find you some. Maybe you can do that. Both camps have some spider webs, but I don't do spiders, so help yourself to that. <laughs> Last one here, children and preschool. We've got two years' worth of wash away that we want to have great new mulch spread. We take the boards off. We just wheelbarrow it in. All of this will be provided for you. You don't have to get this. You just have to show up. That goes for almost all of these projects. Assemble the indoor play set. We talked about that. If you're good with that, please don't make me do that. Outdoor wooden swing set. We need to need people to go around and tighten all the bolts. It's getting a little loose again. Stain the wood. If you've got one of those little stainers and you don't mind doing some outdoor work and you like to stain that, we put, we put some new boards on there that, that are obviously a lot lighter. We want to match it. Paint the hallways in the children's areas. Woo, yes. That's going to be awesome. That, I'm so excited to see what that looks like. We have Sharpies up here, and we have hand sanitizer. When we dismiss in just a minute, if you will come and just sign up and see. We also have people who want to pray. Maybe you can't do any of these things, but you can come and spend a half hour praying. That would be so awesome. We'll have a quiet room set up for that. God is on the move, and I'm so excited about what he's doing. You will not recognize this place come Palm Sunday. That's all I can say, okay? Till a few more surprises have been paid for and revealed, trust me, you do not want to miss Palm Sunday, through Easter especially. It is going to be amazing. It will be something you will feel comfortable and happy to invite your families to, something that has been long overdue. Some of this 1998 carpet, as great as it was, is, it's time for, for some updates. We've updated our homes. We've updated all kinds of things. We don't want to neglect God's house. So here's what we're going to do. One of the most exciting things is the update of what's happening around the world. We've been focusing local, which is great, because that's where we serve. Don't be discouraged if you hear nothing but bad news. Do not be discouraged. Do not lose hope if you think the world is beyond hope. Because there is revival, not only breaking out in pockets in America, but it is sweeping countries. Iraq, Afghanistan. Y'all, it is so underreported what is happening in India right now. The Christian revival that is happening overseas is breathtaking. So hear me, do not lose hope. We are feeling God pour out his Holy Spirit on the remnant. 
This pandemic has revealed, just like it reveals friendships, it has revealed who the army is, who the core is. And you can go to war with that. So do not be discouraged. What God is doing overseas is incredible. So I'm going to ask Pastor Bill to come up here. He's going to close us out. He's going to pray in just a minute. But he wants to share a little bit about what we're doing globally with our Ghana missions team. There is some exciting stuff coming down the pike. So Pastor Bill, you come up. After that, he's going to dismiss. And if you will come up and sign as you go and take some of your food, Miss Priscilla is going to be standing over here, and she will direct traffic for you. It'll be nice and easy. We want to thank Hayden, who stayed up all night working his tail off on this barbecue. Thank you. I want to thank Priscilla. I want to thank all the people, the volunteers that work behind the scenes pulling this together. So, Pastor Bill, when we're finished, if you'll just dismiss us in prayer and okay. tell Should us the good news. She'll come up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, buddy. Okay. Kind of excited. I don't know if you're... of how important it is of us devoting our lives as individuals, it's not just people in ministry, but all of us who claim the name of Christ, for the kingdom's sake, because you do not know who you are touching, how important it is. I was reminded of uh, that two weeks ago. I, I received word that a young man, 17 years old, um, who I know uh, in Ghana that attends the church over there and in the area that we minister, I uh, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, it wasn't from the, the virus. By the way, people are dying all over the world for many things beside, you know, coronavirus. But um, he had passed away. and uh, Unexpected, sudden. And I was thinking back on him because when we were there, our team in November that we went, this young man, not only he was in the Passion Play, he played Judas, he would change, and he played Nicodemus. And there was another role, I forgot where he played, Isaac. And I'd be there telling him, you got to hurry, you got to hurry. And uh, he, as a young boy, attended our, um, you know, children's crusades, got saved. And then, you know, as he got older, he got, was part of the ministry in the church in the Passion Play. And now he's home with the Lord. You know, we take a lot for granted, all right? And I'm saying whatever we do for the cause of Christ, we don't know what the outcome is, whether it's the children in preschool, children's ministry, God's doing something a lot bigger, all right, than what is on our minds. Now, in saying that, I just wanted to make the announcement. I put these flyers on, in fact, Priscilla put these flyers on the back table. She wouldn't trust me to put them on, right? <laughs> but she has them on the back table. Uh, we are announcing our, our trip this summer, July 30th to August 13th. Uh, the Ghana, West Africa, will be ministering over there to the church, boys and girls and families. I know there's been a lot of hardships in the United States, but if you know what is going on globally, um, it is uh, really tough in a lot of these places, all right? As far as monetary, um, people trying to uh, exist with the cost of food, how it's going up, uh, clothing and so forth. Uh, I have an organization that we have donated between 4,000 and 5,000 children's outfits we're going to be distributing over there to boys and girls, and then also ministry. Now, you might be interested in several others that are interested already from the church, but you might be interested in this trip. If you would pray about that, brochure is at the back. Uh, we're given the deadline a little bit later this year. It'll be April 15th that you need to get a hold of me, an application that I would know. But God could use you in a great way, all right? And I've seen it from our young people that have gone talking about teenagers, all right? And uh, again, others who have been part of this ministry. So please pray for that as God assembles that team and remember that in your prayer, okay? How about now we're going to pray for the food, all right? Do we need to pray for it, Hayden? What do you think? All right. <laughs> okay. Priscilla, then uh, you're going to make the announcement of how you want to do this? Yeah. I've got everything set up socially. Just, so you just come and get what you eat for your family. Everything's already kicked off. Should they start in a certain place or what?
and you'll and you'll be over there, right? Okay. Okay, Doug. Let's go ahead and pray if you would join me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. Dear Lord, first of all, dear Lord, for your blessed Son. Dear Lord, I thank you for our salvation because of his atonement on Calvary's cross. That we can have the assurance, whether it's pandemic or whether it's disease, whether it's whatever touches our bodies, that we leave this world, that to be absent of the body is to be present with you. We thank you, dear Lord, for a hope that is enduring, that is steadfast, that is secure. And we rejoice in that. But I pray, dear Heavenly Father, as we have listened to what's been shared this morning, that we would be steadfast in our commitment to you in living the life that you have given us now, that we would commit ourselves in serving you. Dear Lord, that our concern would be more than just about us and our needs, but that we would commit ourselves to you that you would use us in touching the needs, dear Lord, spiritually, physically, dear Lord, of those around us. So use us as a church, dear Lord, for your kingdom's sake. I pray, dear Lord, that you bless this church, dear Lord, in this year that is now coming up, that will be 19th year, that you will give direction, you will give your anointing, that souls will be brought into the kingdom as they hear your glorious gospel. We ask your blessing on this food, dear Lord, the time of fellowship, for we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And again, I want to urge you, Matt has the sheets over there, the Sharpies. Uh, go over there and sign up. Probably if you do that, then that will alleviate a little bit going over to get the food and make it a little bit easier. But God bless and have a blessed Lord's Day. And I think it's going to get warmer this week. Amen. All right. <laughs>